Alexander the Great is considered one of the greatest generals in human history, so much so that his strategies are still studied in military academies today more than 2300 years after his death. Famous for never having lost a battle, his conquest created one of the largest empires in antiquity. But in 332 BC, Alexander faced a unique challenge against the massive walls of the Phoenician city-state of Tyre. The Siege of Tyre challenged Alexander in ways that none of his other battles did and represented the tenacity and brilliance of one of history's most influential figures. Alexander the Great, or Alexander III of Macedon, became King of Macedon at the age of just 20 after his father was assassinated by a member of his own guard. As king, Alexander took charge of his father's plan to lead a Panhellenic alliance in an invasion of their longtime foe, the Greek Achaemenid Empire of Persia. Alexander quickly proved himself to be a brilliant commander. He delivered a decisive defeat to a large Persian and Greek mercenary army at the Battle of the Granicus River in 334. He was received with cheer from Greek cities in Ionia, modern-day Turkey, and then, despite being greatly outnumbered, he defeated Darius, the Persian king, routing his army at the Battle of Issus in 333. It was the first time in history that the Persians had been defeated with the king on the field. Alexander marched across Persian lands almost without pause for two years, accepting the surrender of cities and basking in an aura of invincibility. Many of the cities in Ionia and Syria had been ill-treated under Persian leadership and had recent histories of revolt. By 332, there was only one port friendly to Persia left in the Mediterranean, the heavily fortified island city of Tyre. Alexander's campaign to take the city would become the longest and most complicated siege of his career. Robin Lane Fox, in Alexander's biography, said of the coming siege that, with a characteristic leap forward to meet a challenge, Alexander was now to show for the first time that genius that singles him out in military history. The city of Tyre was at the time the largest and most important city in Phoenicia, and it had prospered under Persia. Without a navy to challenge Persian dominance of the sea, Alexander's strategy had been to fight the navy from shore by capturing its ports and safe havens. The strategy was finally proving to be effective, but in order to make it decisive, he needed to capture all of the Persian-friendly ports on the coast. Though he meant to invade Egypt next, he did not want to leave a base of Persian operations in his rear, where it could threaten, harry, and assault his communication lines. But taking Tyre was not going to be easy. According to Herodotus, Tyre had been founded in 2750 BC on the mainland, but by 332, New Tyre had moved to an island a kilometer away from the coast, and the Tyrians had built walls that extended right up to the water. The Macedonians said the walls rose as much as 150 feet. It had two excellent natural harbors on the north and south side of the island, and had a large fleet at its disposal. It was famous both for the deep purple dye it produced, and as the mother city of many colonies in the Mediterranean, including Carthage, which had promised to send aid to its progenitor. Alexander was used to cities capitulating to him almost without a fight, so he was surprised when the Tyrians rebuffed the envoy he sent to negotiate a peace. Alexander's envoy had asked for permission for Alexander to visit the city, and that Alexander be allowed to make a sacrifice at the temple to their god Melkart, whom Alexander identified with his claimed ancestor Heracles. Realizing this was an attempt to infiltrate the city, instead the city sent a reply that insisted that their city was neutral in the war, and that allowing Alexander to come to the city would mean they were recognizing him as king. The Tyrians had good reason to believe their walls would hold. In the early 6th century BC, the island fortress had withstood a siege from the king of Babylon for 13 years. Angry at being snubbed, Alexander sought a way to take the city, suggesting his engineers build a causeway that his army could use to attack the city. But his engineers had misgivings about their ability to build his suggested causeway, or mole as they called it, across a kilometer of ocean, and without a navy the city seemed beyond their reach. His soldiers were so uncertain of success that Alexander tried to steal their resolve by telling them that he had had a dream in which Heracles had invited him into the city. Even so, Alexander swallowed his pride and sent peace envoys once more to propose an alliance. This time Tyre was more clear. They killed the envoys and threw their bodies over the wall. Alexander was left with no choice but to build the causeway. In looking for a feasible means of building the land bridge, his men identified a sandbar that ran about a half mile towards the island. The relatively shallow water eased the work for Alexander's engineers considerably. Still, the causeway itself was a massive undertaking, as were his innovations to siege craft. The Greeks in general did not have great walls around their cities or use heavy siege equipment. Siege craft in the ancient world was an arms race between siege technique and city defenses. The Tyrians had used arrow catapults, originally invented by Syracusian king Dionysus I, 
but Alexander had an advantage thanks to his father's patronage of engineers. Using the newfound powers of a torsion spring, they had created stone throwing catapults that were effective at 400 yards, twice the distance of the Tyrian catapults, and could damage a wall at 150 yards. The work on the bridge was slow going. Alexander's men demolished the remains of the city on the coast, using its stone and masonry to build the bridge and taking wood from forests in Lebanon. As they did so, they faced the constant harrying of the Tyrian navy. Once the bridge sat across most of the channel, Alexander ordered his men to build two great siege towers that would overlook the walls and would allow his catapults to batter the walls and defenders. Like the catapults, Alexander's towers were magnificent. They left space for archers and battering rams on as many as 20 levels, with drawbridges on each level. They were coated with lime and sheepskin to keep off enemy missiles, and soldier and machine both were protected with metal shields. Alexander had his engineers mount his stone-throwing catapults on top. At first, the Tyrians laughed at Alexander's plans. They shouted at the workers and they harassed them from their warships, thinking Alexander mad for challenging the god of the sea. Alexander wasn't bothered, his officers describing him explaining the steps to his workers in person, encouraging them and giving rewards of money to his best workers. As the causeway grew nearer, the Tyrians began to take their threat more seriously. Once the first two towers were in place to shoot back, they came up with their own brilliant counterstroke. The Tyrants took a transport and filled it with dry timber and other flammable material, and then added pitch and sulfur. Their most brilliant addition to the fire ship was to fix cauldrons of fuel to the ship's masts, which would pour as the ship burned to fan the flames. They weighed down the stern so that the prow of the ship sat above the water, and using triremes to tow it, they ran it towards the causeway, set it alight, and then got clear. The fire ship crashed into Alexander's bridge and set fire to his towers. Tyrian skiffs landed to destroy any other siege equipment, while the Tyrian ships attacked the Macedonian defenders. The move was a complete success. Looking at the situation somewhat grimly, Alexander ordered that the causeway be widened and that more towers and equipment be built. But despite his engineering feats, it was becoming clear that Tyre would not fall if Alexander did not have a navy. But Alexander's fortunes soon turned. He received news that the Persian fleets were returning home, and since most of their home cities now owed allegiance to Alexander, he had reason to believe that those crews would soon serve him. On reaching the city, Alexander found that the kings of Arad and Byblos had deserted the Persians and brought him ships. Sidon's ships joined them, as well as ships from Rhodes. Another 120 ships appeared shortly from Cyprus, a Greek-leaning but until recently Persian-oriented island. Now Alexander had three times as many ships as Tyre as well as 4,000 reinforcements that had arrived from Greece. When Alexander returned with his fleet, he found his causeway damaged by a gale and the Tyrian ports blockaded by a population that was getting ready for a prolonged siege. But unwilling to wait to starve the city out, he brought together engineers from Cyprus, from Phoenicia, and from Greece. One of the first ideas they came up with was to lash pairs of the solar ships together and suspend between them a battering ram covered with roofs of hide, allowing the Phoenician ships to reach the walls and batter them as if they were on dry land. Meanwhile, Alexander was building his largest towers yet, possibly the largest ever built, and he installed his stone throwing catapults on ships to batter the walls. As Alexander doubled down on the siege, both sides devoted themselves to outthinking the other. Tyre dropped enormous boulders into the water near the walls to prevent Alexander's ships from getting close enough to attack the walls. Alexander began towing the rocks onto the ships and firing them out of the catapults. But the Tyrians cut the ropes of the ship's anchors, first with armored ships and then having soldiers swim out to do so, until Alexander had the ropes replaced with metal chains. The Tyrians used pole axes to cut the ropes by which the rams were swung and drop rocks and flames on them from above. To defend against the constant bombardment, the Tyrians hung leather skin stuffed with seaweed over the walls and used huge marble wheels, still not fully understood by history, that spun and deflected the missiles. Alexander's towers were near enough now to present a serious threat to Tyrian soldiers on the walls, but they weren't invincible. Tyrians fitted tridents to long ropes and used them to harpoon Greek soldiers and drag them off. Those who attempted to use the drawbridges to get nearer could be caught in fishing nets and flung into the rocks below, and workers at the foot of the wall were showered with red-hot sand that poured inside their body armor. The siege dragged on, with the situation essentially unchanged as the two sides beat at each other from April until July. Though much of the Persian fleet had been subdued, a number of Persian admirals still threatened Alexander's conquests and refused to turn back on the island or consider a truce, though his army was becoming restless at the lack of success. After an offer of truce was sent by Darius, Parmenion is said to have commented, 
If I were Alexander, I would accept the truce and end the war without further risk. So would I, Alexander replied, if I were Parmenian. The waiting game was getting desperate for everyone. The Macedonian fleet had taken to putting their ships on the shore of the island at the ends of the protected harbors, and the Tyrians took this opportunity for a daring attack, at this point possibly inspired by hunger after the grueling seven-month siege. While the Cypriot crews near the northern harbor had beached their ships and were eating lunch, the Tyrians sent 13 of their fastest ships out to attack. Before the crews could react, the Tyrians had smashed three of the great warships. Unfortunately for the Tyrians, Alexander was in the southern harbor with the crews of some of his ships, and not back on the mainland at his tent, where he usually lunched. Taking his ships to the north harbor, he led the attack on the Tyrian ships, and destroyed them. Not a man to rest on his laurels, Alexander put together an inspired and many-faceted attack that meant to finally finish the siege he had begun so many months earlier. He ordered his battering ships to attack weak points in the wall, had ships with archers and catapults circle the city to distract the enemy, while his fleet was to attack both harbors simultaneously. His engineers had also devised new drawbridges that allowed more soldiers to disembark at once. The most promising breach was on the extreme south side of the island, and it was here that the Macedonians concentrated their infantry. Alexander led the second wave behind the captain, Adamatus, who was killed as he became the first to mount the wall. Alexander led his men into the city. The Tyrians made a spirited defense, but even a desperate stand near the shrine of the city's founder could not stop Alexander. After his conquest, Alexander exacted a steep penalty on the people of Tyre for defying him. 8,000 Tyrian citizens were slaughtered outright. Another 2,000 were crucified on its beaches. 30,000 and most of the rest of the population were sold into slavery. Alexander was only merciful to the few who had managed to seek refuge in temples and shrines, among them Zemachus, the king of Tyre, whom Alexander allowed to live and continue to be king, although Alexander left his own men to populate and garrison the city. The siege of Tyre also changed the geography of the coast. Today's Tyre is no longer an island, as silt and sand has built along Alexander's causeway, creating a land bridge that has buried the southern harbor and created an artificial isthmus. Later the same year, Alexander used many of the siege tactics that he'd learned at Tyre to defeat the fortified city of Gaza in just two months. Alexander had stranded the Persian fleets and left his army open to attack one of the Persian Empire's greatest kingdoms, Egypt. The Siege of Tyre, one of the most complex battles of the ancient world, well demonstrated the ingenuity, the tenacity, and the brutality of one of history's greatest generals. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.